Well, hello, everybody. I'm especially pleased to be speaking at the Chartered Management Institute to celebrate 50 years of CMI Women, a network for everyone who champions gender equality at work. It is important to me that we all see an inclusive culture as the normal state of play and naturally desire to eradicate breeding grounds for exclusion wherever we find them. In practice, in my own career, this has led me to refuse bonus pay offered for championing diversity. For me, this was simply an essential part of the quality leadership expected of me by the stakeholders. Now, this does not mean that people should be ignored when they drive chains towards more equal, diverse and inclusive organizations. In fact, far from it. What it does mean is that we need to recognize this behavior as a core competency for managers and leaders that should be developed in order to perform and to progress. Now, I'm pleased to say that the CMI's professional standard does just this, mapping this competency through five stages, from those at the start of their management careers, helping to encourage the value of diversity, inclusion and equal opportunity within a team, to leaders embedding equality, diversity and inclusion throughout organizational relationships and networks. Individuals who don't understand that inclusion is a key management and leadership competency will inevitably fail. And companies lagging behind on this issue now have limited time to put in the work to catch up. I cannot continue to say the time to act is now because in truth for many companies, the time to act was then. All organizations and governments have a role to play in helping to close the gender gap. Business must be part of the solution by embedding women's empowerment within their own strategies and business goals. When I was chief executive for Unilever from 2009 to 2019, during this time, we made significant strides towards a gender balanced and inclusive organization. In fact, the proportion of women in management rose from 37% to about 50% globally. It was equally important for me to have a board comprised of 50% women and 50% men, which made us probably an outlier at the time. And frustratingly, this probably is still the case today. We launched the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan now in its 10th year, which included the commitment to empower 5 million women throughout Unilever's value chain by 2020. The 2020 Unilever Sustainable Living Report includes the achievement of enabling more than 2 million women to access initiatives aimed to promote their safety, develop their skills, or indeed expand their opportunities. In my own experience, almost every success story involves setting targets at every level and tracking them rigorously throughout. But as Rebecca Marmer, Chief Sustainability Officer at, at Unilever said earlier this year, there have been hurdles along the way, in particularly measuring the impact of initiatives to enhance opportunities for women has proven to be difficult. Now, to overcome this challenge, we need more professional managers and leaders who are committed to advancing the science of management by testing initiatives, measuring their impacts and sharing the results for the benefit and review of others. The Chartered Management Institute, through its unique charitable mission and work with CMI Women, should continue to be at the center of these efforts. Now, today I'm proud to co-lead Imagine, which actually helps companies meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals, including goal number five, achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. 2020 needed to herald a decade of ambitious action, but it is fair to say that the world is not in an easy position right now. We have not yet fulfilled the promise of a world in which every woman and girl enjoys full gender equality, and where all barriers to their empowerment have been removed. In fact, we may now be even more distant than before due to the gendered impact of the COVID pandemic. Women 
are likely to take on the most additional care work owing to the closure of schools and daycare centers. We've also seen that they are on the front lines in fighting the virus, since women account for about 70% of health and social workers globally. The SDG 2020 report shows that on average, women spend about three times as many hours in unpaid domestic and care work as men do. Time spent in these activities tends to be even higher for women with young children at home. Now in Britain alone, the lockdowns have resulted in millions of parents suddenly have to look after their children, including homeschooling them, whilst working at the same time. In fact, UK national statistics show that women continue to shoulder more childcare responsibility and concerns have been raised about the impact that this may have on gender balance, progression and equal pay in the workplace, especially at the more senior levels. CMI's management transformed research found that flexibility is key to offsetting these impacts on working mothers and that managers need to improve their communication for women with childbearing responsibilities. However, it is not just managers who need to provide more support for working mothers. Earlier this year, the He for She at Home campaign launched to highlight this unfair burden on women and encourage men to actually carry their equal share. Now, I was proud to help establish for the UN the He for She initiative back in 2014 because men need to be able to understand and explain clearly that supporting women does not mean that men lose out. Everyone wins from gender equality. It's as good for men as it is for women, because empowering women and girls represents probably the single biggest opportunity for human development and obviously also economic growth. He for she supporters include many male leaders who are actively advocating for their female colleagues in leadership and sponsoring female co-workers for senior positions. These male allies are challenging stereotypes to act as barriers to women's progression, changing their own leadership styles to become more inclusive and reshaping work culture for a fairer and richer future. Allyship is essential, but I recognize it's not easy. At Unilever, I had to be very thorough, analytical and disciplined about our merit system to counter false perceptions and arguments that women were only being hired or promoted to meet targets and not because they in fact deserve to be. The first practical act of male allyship is to champion gender equality initiatives and defend them against those who don't. There is a chasm between helping to shape initiatives through constructive feedback because you want them to be successful and sustainable and being critical because you don't support actions to advance women's empowerment at work. Well, so my first challenge to men is to get involved, involved for the right reasons and help others to understand those reasons. Secondly, all male managers should be dedicating time to mentoring women. If you do not have at least one female mentee, this must be resolved straight away. And since CMI has a mentoring matching service, there really is no excuse. I also challenge men to show their commitment by developing sponsorship shortlists, which should be diverse and gender balanced. While spotting talent is an ongoing task, you can in fact start today by jotting down a list of women in your teams who you could support more directly. This support can be demonstrated in many different ways, advocating for promotion on their behalf, making introductions to influential people in your network, making sure they have opportunities for visible priority work, or recommending them for presentations to senior leaders or to speak at high profile events. Look for opportunities, for opportunities to demonstrate recognition regularly, ensure women are praised and credited for their success, 
and for special contributions. Look for awards or rewards you could nominate them for. There are many other practical ways men can become better allies. We should be role models for flexible working and inclusive working practices, whilst challenging work practices that do not foster an inclusive culture. We need to call out microaggression, bias and any form of marginalization. But I pose a third straightforward challenge to men. Consider how women are involved in all decision making. There's in fact no excuse for a male only meeting to take place without the lack of gender diversity being raised and clear action to address this being taken. As a male ally faced with a situation where a decision is being made only or predominantly by men, my first question needs to be, why are we considering making this decision with no or so, f or so few women involved? It's wrong and it's bad for business. Speaking candidly, we must be aware that supporting women may become harder as greater progress towards gender equality is made. As a gap narrows, it can be deprioritized and the underlying problem easier to brush away. Consider the improvements brought about by international commitments to gender equality. In fact, women's representation in the political arena is higher than ever before, one of the positive areas of movement. New ground is being broken by figures such as Jacinda Ardern, who in 2017 became the youngest female head of government at 37 and shortly after gave birth whilst in office, following only uh, Benazir Bhutto in this respect. The record was broken again in 2019 when we got a female prime minister in Finland, just 14, 34 years old. And earlier this year, Kamala Harris was elected to become the first female vice president of the United States. Happily, the list of women breaking down barriers in political leadership all over the world goes on. However, some may use the pioneering achievement of these women and others like them to deny the existence of barriers to opportunity and progression for women across the world. With so much to celebrate, it can easily be that we forget that more progress can and must be made. Consider what the data tell us about the management pipeline. For example, in, 19, in 2019, just 28% of managerial positions in the world were occupied by women. Has progress been made? Well, yes, but only a small increase of three percentage points in nearly two decades. We haven't yet reached the states where one in three managers globally are women, despite women representing half of the world's working population. I know it can be uncomfortable to talk about inequality when we want to raise awareness of progress and success. But in the world of business, we must commend every new female board member, every new chief executive, leader and manager, whilst ensuring that organizations and governments are still held to account for their roles in closing the gender equality gap. Networks like CMI Women hold a powerful position in this effort. They allow us to track the progress made in creating the pipeline for women into management, as well as leadership through regular updates and reports. They bring people together to celebrate the change makers and provide the valuable opportunities for knowledge to be developed and best practices to be shared. I am delighted that CMI women are celebrating the achievements made over the last 50 years and projecting a vision for the future of women in management and leadership over the next 50 years. This year 2020 has been so incredibly difficult for so many people, but not all of us have experienced the same level of difficulty. Ask yourself if you, like me, have been protected on an island of prosperity within a sea of poverty? Have you benefited from privileges in ways that others have not? Well, let's respond by all collaborating with optimism to create a vision for the future that includes everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now the decade for action 
and we must act together. Thank you very much.